Welcome back to Spirit Squared. I'm your host, Andrew Darrington. Tonight, we're going to switch things up. Uh, we're not going to talk about whiskey as much as we have been. Uh, we've got a, a, a medical professional tonight, uh, Dylan Weinberg. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I uh, really appreciate what you do, um, number one. And I knew immediately when we were going to do this that you'd be a good candidate to, to have come on and talk about something that's pretty pretty important to all of us. We don't really think about it until it comes up. Um, so thanks so much for being here. Um, Dylan is uh, an organ uh, transplant coordinator, um, and he also uh, has authored an MCAD book. Uh, so you know you know what you're doing. Um, he's gone through EMS school uh, quite a few years there too. Um, so I'm looking forward to to talking a lot about what you do um, and the spirit that you do. Uh, first thing first, we did pour uh, a nice uh, pour of a bottle that I'm proud of. Um, we did this barrel together. Uh, you had recently fallen off your roof. Yeah. <laughs> so you were in a wheelchair for, um, and you had a couple halos on your legs. Still got the big bun though. <laughs> yeah, that's good. And uh, this is Duality. It's uh, made by uh, a company in Atlanta, Georgia. I uh, love them, love this pick. Uh, and I, I love that it was our first barrel uh, for our, our Garden Valley group um, and uh, enjoy it, enjoying it tonight for sure. Yeah, no, it's, it's one that, like I said, coming back to revisit it is just so unique. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll definitely be cracking my and all right sometime soon. So let's take, let's take, by the way, you're, how tall are you? Six five. You're six five. You're 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 a big guy, right? Oh yeah. So why do you why do you get a Chevy Cobalt? <laughs> because I was broke at high school and it was all I could afford. And you paid. You used all your graduation money to deck it out. I did, yeah. So I I got a little bit of graduation money and I had to make sure to put two subs in it, a big amp, a capacitor, two door speakers, tweeters, an amp for that, and a touchscreen written up. Makes sense. College money well spent. I turned out just fine. And so thanks everybody to the graduation money fund. It was used up uh, for good for good stuff. So you graduated high school. I, I wanted to inject that in there. Uh, a little something I found out about you. Yeah. Um and uh so what led you to a path of being an EMS? Honestly, man, ever since I was little, I wanted to be a fire. Like, I had fire trucks. I had firefighter figurines. I watched There Goes a Fire Truck a million times. He was all backdraft when I was like seven. Still my favorite movie to this day. Um, and so I always kind of had that burning desire to do it. It didn't really hit me in the face until I was working at a call center, just selling insurance. I was in college, I think, for sports medicine, like most athletes that get out of high school do. Um, and then I came up on a pretty nasty wreck right there in front of the college. Um, and uh, that'll stick with me forever. There was a kid that was about my age, turned over in a car, um, in a seat belt that we weren't able to get off. And ultimately what happened is the, the gasoline tank caught fire. Um, the car caught fire. He burned up in front of me in that car. Mm. Uh, and so as traumatic as that was, I remember looking at the road and seeing the fire truck screaming down the road, the ambulance coming, all the people that are coming, rushing to that help. And it was at that point I knew that's what I want to do. That's what's going to give me purpose. That's what I was, what I was put here to do. You know, after that, um, I shortly thereafter went to EMT school. With the full expectation of I'm going to go to EOT school, I'm going to go to the fire academy, I'll be done, I'll be a firefighter, I'll fire truck. Never was really interested in the medical at all, honestly. I wanted to be a burly fireman that knocked out doors, put water on fire. And then as I got into paramedic school, because a lot of people don't know, the jobs are hard to come by. They're very competitive. Mm. Uh, so, for example, I went to an urging firefighter test one time. There was a, a 5A high school cafeteria full of candidates. And the fire chief stood up and said, hey, we've got great candidates this year. We're really excited. We're hiring two people. Wow. Two people. So in order to increase that resume, I went to paramedic school. 
because it gave me an opportunity to elevate myself. And then when I got to paramedic school, I realized that I really enjoyed medicine. I took the medicine. I understood it. Um, and it was, it was very fun and enjoyable. What did it, what did it look like? I mean, what was it? Why the anatomy classes? Or- yeah, so you get the basic anatomy classes. Um, your DOT is more, I think it's more difficult, honestly, because you're a fresh canvas. You have no medical understanding. Me, I had no medical understanding whatsoever. So all I knew is they drive the ambulance, they show up, they put them all like, ah, when we go to the hospital. Right. And there's an instructor, so shout out to my EMT instructor, Chris Ray, who was a Longview captain for a long time. He actually would, in EMT school, go, he would say, well, y'all don't worry about that because you're not a paramedic, you can't do it. Mm. Or you're not a paramedic, you can't you can't perform that procedure. You're going to be driving. The paramedic will be in the back. Or it is other that we get you beside. Right. And so that piqued my interest. And I was like, no, I don't want to drive the truck and, and not have all the schools available to me. I want to know everything. Right. And so at that point is when I went to paramedic school. And it, it teaches you a lot about you know, certain patient populations, pediatrics, you learn about, geriatrics, you learn about, you learn about uh, cardiology, respiratory emergencies, a lot of trauma, and how to mitigate factors that happen from trauma. Because, I mean, pop quiz, I'll ask you a question. If, if, no, so if it happens to you at a trauma, yeah. if I shoot you in the chest, yeah. is a paramedic really going to do anything to definitively fix you? No. So they're saying they tell the hospital. What if you're going to definitively fix you? A dot? Exactly. A surge, right? They're going to go in there, pull it, pull it out, stop the bleeding, sure. did you, uh, that kind of thing. So there's things that happen in the interim of that. And they may do things that, that help me live right. until I get to the surge. Correct. Right. There's things that happen in the interim of that that we can intervene on and not make worse in order to get you to right. what we call definitive care. Yeah. And so you learn about a lot of things. There's a lot of clinical hours that go into it. So you're basically working for free. You're on mm-hmm. an ambulance. Um, you're you're in paramedic school in class. So I think I had class one day for eight to five, get done, get home, change into my my uniform, get on the ambulance at seven, ride it till seven AM, go back to class till five, and then I was finally off. You also have ER hour rotations that you do. So sure. you can follow around the dock and see kind of what they deal with in the ER, what you're handing over and what actually happens after you're you're done. You give them the patient, you can see kind of the progression right. of their illness or trauma uh, or injury. I bet you there's a lot of moments uh, that where you walk you get into the ER and you're like, I know that I've heard a lot of stories of uh, either nurses or paramedics where you're like how in the, how in the hell did you do that yeah i had a, a guy one time he uh he was well, like why did you do that why'd you put that in your butt or i like so we call that the case of the christmas cucumber and everybody has those stories where they're like oh my god i fell on it <laughs> you didn't fall on that on accident right i can promise you that everybody has those x-rays that are funny but the one of the funniest stories i think of was a guy that got into a fight with his wife. They started arguing, bickering back and forth. Uh, and the, the dude was like an Olympian. He threw the javelin. Mm. Well, he had the javelin over his fireplace, kind of like that big marlin. And uh, the wife got sick and tired of him bickering and grabbed the javelin off the fireplace and impaled him with the javelin through his chest, through the recliner. And so I'll never forget when that call came out. It was, it was very matter of fact. That, hey, we need you route. Uh, you know, Jackson with fired engine route for a patient in the with job. And we're like, what? Yeah. So I just dispatch me. Uh, can you repeat that? Yeah. Impaled with job. Like, okay. All right. Well, here we go. And sure enough, he was talking crap to her still when we got there. And I'm like, Hey, shut up before she finishes the job. You know, just so there's a lot of, well, just, yeah, there's a lot of stories you think about that, that are funny. And then also stories that, are not so funny and don't have good outcomes and they can keep with you, you know, right. for as long as, as your career and even after that, for that, I you yeah. know. Sure. Um, so how, how long did you do the EMS paramedic? So I did ride a bus. I did, uh, so I rode the box for uh, right around six or seven years. Um, I went from ETMC EMS, which ran Tyler, Philip became UT, 
went to Jacksonville Fire Department, was a firefighter paramedic, followed that train, did that. And then I kind of wanted something more in medicine. So then I went to Care of Light, learned about critical care paramedics and what they're able to do and, and some of the stuff that they're able to intervene in um, and are trusted with. And so I thought, man, that's right up my alley. I want to learn more. That's kind of how I've always been. Um, and so I got into the critical care side of things and then took my flight paramedic Sam. My criticism is real. Oh, so, yeah. Never been on a helicopter. Uh, well, you can see on camera that I'm not built for a helicopter necessarily. So they have street weight requirements. I was never able to make, but uh, I did critical care ground, which was ultimately a rolling helicopter. So a lot of things that I did, mm-hmm. you couldn't even fit the amount of equipment it took into a helicopter to fly with. Right, right. Um, and so I got, I had the same set of protocols, same scope, uh, and I got to learn and, and do a lot of fun stuff. Anything from chest tubes to central lines to uh, just about anything that you could think of, we were trusted with doing it. And that was kind of where I licked my chops. That was, I guess, where I call it item my paramedic career is walking in a building and having an infinite toolbox mm. to be able to make a change. And and that was when I really just kind of licked my chops. And I was like, hey, let's get in the right. This is why we're here. And I took pride in that. Yeah, a lot. Cool. So so you're, you're doing that six, seven years. And then you make the jump what do you jump to? Do you jump all the way to transplant? So actually, I got into education. Uh, I got into education. Uh, and so at Care Flight, I was a critical care educator for all the critical care paramedics when I promoted. And then I got with a company called IMED. Um, and IMED was a company that taught aspiring flight nurses and flight paramedics critical care. Mm. It was a four day prep course taught all over the United States. So it's a great opportunity for me somewhere that, you know, somebody that's never really been many places, all of a sudden I'm able to pick and choose. I want to teach in New York and South Carolina, California, Reno, and, and go to all these places and affect all these people. Sounds like a fun job. It was, um, guy. It was a well, great deal of fun. I really enjoyed it. Um, and then my daughter was born and I realized how often I was gone. Right. And how much it took away from my family. And so at that point I kind of had to make a decision on so uh, right after I published my, my study guide, the OCAD, I felt like I had uh felt like I had delivered on that and the promise I had to put that out there and once that project was completed I decided to step away from for a teacher. All right, so step back just a second. You 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 co wrote, right? The, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm the, I guess, considered the main author. Main author. Uh, but there's two co-authors, so shout out to Chris Matana. He's one of my best friends. He's actually the CEO of the company at IMED who gave me my opportunity to be a published author. Uh, and his wife, who's actually a perfusionist, hmm. which is a higher level of knowledge than what I have. Uh, and she was a great resource to be able to pull from and, and be able to factually check the information. Right. Um, as well as some of the cardiologists that I've worked with in the transplant field, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Tawasa Lexi, Dr. Cindy Martin, uh, and Rishi Kumar, who does RKMD, uh, it's his all medical podcast. So oh, shout cool. out to those guys. Cause yeah. without them, uh, that book would not have been successful. How long did it take you to write it? Man. Study that. Well, uh, close to eight months. Eight um, months? Close to eight months to write it. Uh, yeah, it was actually a lot faster than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, probably would have been done faster if I wouldn't have fallen off that roof. Right, uh, because I was just in the middle of trying to finish all that when that happened, so I kind of had to take a back seat to uh, to finishing it until I was able to get out of the hospital. But it was uh, it was definitely a huge project. Yeah, like my si- I, my sister just uh, posted it. that she she is a uh, a doctor of law and wrote a uh, a chat. You you could tell when she posted it, it was like rigorous. Oh yeah, and it, you know it's it's just taxing to get all the information right, validate it, make sure it's pertinent, make sure that it's relevant, make sure that it's it's going to be a uh, freeful to the reader. Um, so I'm sure that was. Would you do it again? Yeah, man, it was it was a great experience. Um, you know, a lot of people don't get to publish, especially that are paramedics. So I'm grateful for that opportunity. It taught me a lot, honestly. As well, as you dive into that information, you think you know it, and you dive in more and more and more, and you sh- you learn more about it. But you hit all the points. So, 
when you create something, your name's on yeah, that. Sure. Your name's on that, and everybody else is going to know that. So you want it to be valid. You want it to be relevant. Sure. You want it to be concise, and you want it to be appreciated because not only did you work hard on it, that's that's your name on that. Sure. And there's a lot of sense of pride when it comes to that. Um, and so, yeah, it was it was something that was, was it taxing? Sure. Would I do it all over again in a heartbeat? And it's full. Yeah. No. Um, so before we move on to Transclave, when you were at EMS, did you fall into any into any windows and on any beds? Man, who did you talk to? Uh, yeah. So embarrassing story alert. Um, when I was uh, like a rescue Randy and fresh off of probation, probably about a month off probation, and it, you know I was. One of those that they call nine one one. We gotta save and we gotta hurry. We gotta get in there right now, right now. Hurry, hurry, hurry. And not that you don't do that when you're more seasoned, but you're right. you're more uh, understanding of what's going on. You know the situation. You have that situational awareness, that critical thinking. Sure. At 22 years old, I didn't have right. so uh, we got a call for personal distress, a suspected cardiac arrest. We made it to a, a part of town that was less desirable than others. And nobody would answer the door. Normally, 911 will tell you EMS is on the way, keep the door open, turn your cords wide, all, yeah. all these fun things. Well, they didn't do that. But I was convinced that it was this house because that was the address that we had. Didn't question it. Went to the back of the house. Hey, I've got an open window here. It's like one, two o'clock in the morning. Open the window up, crawl through the back of it. And instead of falling on the floor, I fell in bed in between husband and wife. As they were asleep, we could imagine their, uh, you could imagine their surprise. Right. And I mean, literally all I heard when I get to bed was, oh, and then they kind of woke up. We're like, oh my God, I'm just falling all over wrong. It's like, no, 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 I don't want to EMS. Don't shoot me, please God. <laughs> um, and come to find out it was, uh, it was somebody that was ultimately having a mental emergency that it called 911 for a random house just because. And, uh, yeah. Sounds like so what? Everybody has a learning curve. You know? <laughs> that's yeah, that's right. right. And that was mine. I've had many, but that was that was definitely one up for sure. Real real. All right. So let's move to fence play. All right. I had to dig. I had to do some digging. You know, you did the job. I'm I got a feeling I know when you spoke. <laughs> you probably did. Yeah. Um. So uh. So your girl's born. It was precious. Awesome. She just started pre-K. She did. Uh. And so she's born. You. 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 How did you? Get into the transplant field. You had a connection. Maybe yeah. so there's a, one of my uh, my greatest mentors, Mike Moro. Shout out to Mike if he ever watches this. He taught my IABED course when I went to learn to be a flight paramedic. Gotcha. And we hit it off. He was an instructor that is very charismatic. He'd been there, done that. He had flown in Alaska as a flight paramedic in Alaska for 15 years. And we just really hit it off. We kept close, texted back and forth. But one day out of the blue, I was actually in an ambulance. He called me. He said, hey, what do you think about doing what I do? And I was like, what do you mean? He goes, you know, like being a lung transplant coordinator. And I, I literally was like, like, you sure you got the right guy? Like, are you are you certain you want to be me? And he said, yeah, man, I think you'd be good for it. So uh, I put in for a couple of part-time positions, got both of those, and just worked my butt off to learn to be available to anybody that aided me to cover those hours, to give face time and, and time to talk to these surgeons and build that forward, build the relationship. And uh, eventually we had a position come open. Our, our call volume actually increased. What we calculated was 250% mm. as opposed to what we were doing in 2020, 2019. Uh, so they added a fourth coordinator. And when they added a fourth coordinator, I was the guy. Yeah, because I was already in there part time. I was part time. I do the system. Yeah. I do the employees. I do every so. That was how I ultimately made it in full time. Full time, gotcha. And you've been doing that for a couple of years. Yeah, so I've been full time with uh, with University of Minnesota. So Golden Gophers. Um, I've been full time with them now for uh, around three years. Gotcha. So what is a when you're on call? What does a day look like? So a lot like being a paramedic man, it, it's hit or miss. It can be it can be twenty different things. Uh, normally, you know, our ship change starts at seven. Uh, I'm lucky and and very fortunate that this position is remote. So 
a lot of people are probably thinking, well, how the hell does he work in Minnesota if he's old Texas? Right. It's a remote position. Um, but shift changes at 7. We try to do our shift hands on uh, and offs by seven, 6.30. And those have to be really tight uh, just because if we've got active cases where things are in the middle of being set up, we're calling patients in, we're getting resources where they need to be, and we've got certain times we need to meet. All those things have to be very meticulously put out there so nothing is missed, handing off to one person or right. getting a report from another. Sure. And then after that, we sign into uh, what's called UNOS, so the United Network for Ordeal Sharing. Um, and that's where we get all of our organ offers from. I do heart and lung. So any heart offer, law offer that comes in for any of the recipients at the University of Minnesota, uh, I look at those organs, evaluate those. And uh, we've got some standing orders where we can just decide this isn't going to work for our recipient for a couple different reasons. Or I may say, well, I'm going to work on this a little bit and and see if I can give some meds and do some some ventilator changes and see if I can improve this donor's organs before I ultimately call a surgeon. So you have someone who's who's not there. Yeah. So you've got two different types. Uh, so everybody thinks of the classic scenario of an organ donor as they're going into the OR, they're going to pull the ET tube, so the endotracheal tube that's on the vet, and breathe in for them. And, and they're going to have to go pulseless and atinate, meaning they don't have a, a pulse, they don't have a blood pressure, and they're not breathing for a certain period of time, and they arch the organs. And that's partially true. That's one type of donor. Sure. There's another donor that is more common called a brain-dead donor, and that is the lights are on, but nobody's home. Meaning, for whatever reason, whether it be stroke, traumatic illness, overdose, uh, a, a host of things that I could name, it has affected their brainstem function to where no longer the brain communicates with the body. And so at that point, they're considered brain dead. And those those donors actually can stay on a ventilator with a pulse and a heart beating up until the time of, uh, of donation. And ultimately, even in uh we'll keep their heart beating and, and uh, keep those organs going, oxygenated with blood, et cetera, as long as we possibly can right, right before we take the organs out. What does the coordination look like? You know, obviously, a doctor's involved, right? Yeah. So, in, uh, so who else? Are the, who are the who are the key player? What? Yeah. How to kind of coordinate? With? So, so ultimately, when an organ is accepted for transplant, uh, it sets off a chain of events um, and a chain reaction where we've got to do a couple of things. Uh, so, we work with uh, organ procurement organizations, will be referred to as an OBO. Uh, for those of you in Texas, you may be familiar with Life Gift. You might be familiar with uh, TOSA, Texas Organ Sharing Alliance in San Antonio. And there's also uh, STA, Southwest Transplant Alliance, which normally covers uh, the DFW area. Um, we'll work with them to set a time for the, the organ procurement or harvest to take place. Once we get a time set up, we'll call in. So I'm very fortunate to be able to call the recipient in. Uh, so I get to be the one to make the phone call to say, hey, we found you in Oregon. Uh, and talk about a special feeling, man. So like Christmas, New Year's, Thanksgiving, birthday, Easter, uh, pretty much all the major holidays I've gotten to, to call somebody and say, hey, you've got a like, chance at, at life and find a word that the transplant. Right. And some of these patients are so sick that I, I can't even talk to them. And some of these patients are at home and and they're, you know, ill, but they're not as ill as some of these folks in the hospital. That dialysis every day or... Yeah, or, or just on a ventilator. Is their lungs are no longer functioning or, um, you know, just a, a host of different things. So being able to make that call, uh, you kind of turn into a wedding planner. And that's that's kind of what I explain my job as is I'm a wedding planner for heart and lung transplants. So what I mean by that is I'm responsible for making sure everybody is there all time. Everybody knows their assignment, knows where to go, and everybody that needs to be called is called. So this dance and wedding, if you will, takes place seamlessly without any hiccups. And if there is hiccups, I'm also responsible for figuring out how to mitigate those and get around those where we can still ultimately do what we're trying to do, and that's get somebody transplanted. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I'm responsible for 
you know, be calling blood bank, making sure immunology is involved, having the OR set prepped and ready, making sure the surgeons are on the same page, having my procurement fellows, white info, so they can get on the plane, know where to go, be picked up, um, all the supplies, get sent to them. So it's, I, I guess, the grant facilitator of of all these things to occur. Are there are there folks? I'm gonna circle back. So you're mostly your recipients are mostly in and so is that right? Uh, so yeah, I mean, they're they're patients of the University of Minnesota. Yes. Okay. And so, are the donors mostly from that area? No. So donors can go from anywhere in the United okay. States. Okay. Um, and it goes off of uh, two different things. So, I, like I said, I deal with cardiothoracic organs. So we're talking specifically lungs to arch here. Um, for lungs, they go off what's called the continuous allocation score. And that basically ranks you in a, a couple of different criteria. What your pulmonary disease is, what your immunology uh, looks like as far as your compatibility um, and antibodies go. And then also how sick you are. Are you on a ventilator? Are you on ECMO? Are you on? Are you on high flow oxygen? Are you on low fly oxygen, low flow oxygen, et cetera? And so that lists you nationally. And so when my patients come up on this national list, is when I get a call and say, "Hey, you have a potential match," or it could go to, "Well, yes, it's a potential match, but now you are what we call primary, meaning now I have the opportunity to say yes or no. It's now offered to me." or my team, not me. So I'm just one person. I, I work with a very, very special and very talented team. It's offered to our team to say, do we want this for one of our recipients or do we not? Right. And that's ultimately when our work starts. Hmm. So uh, you get a you get a match. And I, I know for don donating organs, I've always pictured like, you know, you have a surgeon in there, they harvest the, the, the organ, they load it. Is this Old Partner? Th this is Old Partner. This is one of Dylan's favorites. Yeah, so not to <laughs> take me away from what you're saying, but a special, special story about this bottle. Uh, Drew had just moved into this, his new hole, yep. uh, and we had tried this one time before. Very, very special pour. Extremely good if, if you guys are into bourbon. I highly recommend you try this. And this batch especially very good. Yep. Um, but it was at the very top shelf of his bar, Right, and so I asked. I said, "Hey, let's have a pour of that," because he was he was open to us having whatever. And he said, "Well, man, I don't have a ladder to get up there and get it." And I was like, "Well, you don't need a ladder." So I got down on all fours, and he used my back as a step stool. So he said, "We'll get this down, and you remote that we can have a good pour." Yeah, he was motivated to that, and I would do it again because this stuff is is special. It is. Sorry to take you away. No, no, no. So I was just saying that when I think about. uh transplanting organs you have the surgeon they harvest the organ and then it gets maybe like special treatment obviously iced down or something put in a baggie of some kind and then let's just say for the sake of saying if your recipient is or your uh your donor is there's got to be like a, a mileage restriction maybe or you would think so um a couple different answers to what you're asked a bit there is times in which we'll use uh, ice to store our organs, which is just what we call cold storage. Same thing you're talking about. Organs come out, they get flushed on the back table, they go into a baggie, they go in ice on a cooler, and away they go. And that typically does have, depending on who you work for and how aggressive your, your program is, typically for hearts, you're looking at four hours or less, but mm -hmm. time of for time of leaving or being on the back table out of the body to implant it in, into the new recipient. And for lungs, anywhere from six to eight hours. And depending on other programs, even longer than that. But technology is crazy. And a couple of things we do now is what's called OCS, the board and care system. And what that does is that actually allows us to take the, for instance, lungs, take the lungs out of the body, put them onto this machine, ventilate them with a ventilator, perfuse them with blood, and continue to oxygenate these lungs, ventilate these lungs, let them improve, because there's certain things that can make lungs look bad on paper, but they're actually great lungs. 
one of them is body habitus. So if you're a big guy, even like myself, if I'm laying down flat in a bed on a ventilator for so long, a couple of things happen. Number one, you get uh, what's called, person referred to as atelectasis of the alveoli. So your your <laughs> air sac, <laughs> so where all your ventilator day. takes place, it sticks down and gets stuck on itself. So that area of the lung can't open up, and if that area of the lung can't open up, that place can't oxygenate. So the more areas we have open up, the better oxygenation becomes. Sure. The, the other thing is when I put a lot of, uh, if I'm laying down flat for a long period of time, one of the most uh, prevalent things that happen in an ICU uh, that cause infection about 60 or more percent of the time is what's called ventilator-acquired pneumonia, meaning they've been on a vent for so long, you know, infections and bacteria and, and those things like wet, dark places. And a long is a great place for that fester. Sure. So if I'm not turning my patient or proning my patient or raw, uh, using raw proscopy for therapy or pulmonary toilet, all these things that I could do to make sure that I'm cleaning these out or keeping them open, uh, pneumonia can happen. So a couple of different things, going back to your, your original question, when we put these all in the machine, we can do bronchoscopy, meaning we put a, a tube down the trachea, it looks into each of the bronchi, the lungs, we can go down to the lower lobes and suck out any mucus or, or anything we may see to clean them up. We also can leave them all in the machine for a while, fuse them with oxygenated wood, and we also can uh, ventilate them with a ventilator to specific settings we like to allow to prove. Uh, and they come rolling in. On a box, man. I mean, the lungs, you can see them. They're on the lungs. They have a stream, and, and they're being ventilated. Yeah, wow. absolutely. And now we've actually started doing that with arts. And so you can take a heart and put it on the machine and, and do the same thing. So with your answer to time, if it's cold storage, yes. So there's absolutely a time frame in which, or a mileage, nautical miles is normally what we talk in terms of, that we can say yes or no. Right. Um, if it's on that machine, uh, I've done lungs on that machine for up to 24 hours later. So time and distance is not really a thing when it comes to that. But they're not flying those things. They're dry. No, they fly. What? Yeah, absolutely. So we have specialized aircraft okay. that are retrofit with brackets that will hold that machine and all the personnel requires wow. in order to get them. So that's when you start talking about getting lungs from places or organs from places. Uh, cardiothoracic organs such as like California or Texas or Florida or New York, uh, you know, it really does open you up to anywhere in the United States. Wow. All right. I'm going to let you help a little bit. Of well, really how to exit. Um, so the recipient gets the lungs, gets the art, What's life like afterward? No, so that's a good question. Um, it's uh, it's more difficult for sure. I can't speak with four recipients because I've never been one. I've never been in that situation. Uh, we always say that if you take care of the organ, the organ will take care of you. Yeah. Um, and so uh, one thing that I can tell you for certain is that you're on a lot more vacation. Uh, you're typically on, you know, some form of steroid. You're also on immunosuppressants. Right. And being on immunosuppressants, meaning if I suppress the immune system from being able to fight anything, I'm a lot more prevalent and have to be a lot more careful with infection. So pneumonias, uh, COVID was a very big deal when COVID happened uh, for a lot of our recipients to try to keep them safe and, and et cetera. Um, because they are so immunosuppressed that a common cold that would not affect us could ultimately affect them in a very negative way. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, you know, you also have to make sure that you're staying in good shape, that your cardiovascular system you're taking care of, um, and your cardio is, is doing well. Uh, you know, hopefully you don't smoke anymore. And honestly, you should, like if, if you're getting an organ from, somebody you should want to take care of that mm -hmm. because it's the ultimate gift you can give somebody towards on concern sure uh you know one donor and and this is where i get to tell all of you guys listening or watching become an organ donor uh, because you have no idea how many lives you can affect and and the point is you're you're gone 
you don't need those organs anymore. But you can affect up to eight people. You can say eight people with just you as a person. So pancreas, small intestine, heart, kidneys, right lung, left lung, and liver. Corneas. Corneas, that's, that's more of your tissue donation, which is absolutely important with skin grafts. Yep. Um, you can also be a, a, a organ and tissue uh, donor, so that is going to include stuff like your veins, your your arteries, your uh, heart valves, um, but eight people. And then the other one, so I named seven, you can actually take a liver and split it in half and give it to two different recipients. So that's eight people that you have the ability to change their life forever uh, just by becoming an organ donor and supporting that mission. So uh, thank you very much for having me on sure, here. But sure. that, that is the message that I want to be perfectly clear about is... You know, the reason I felt called to do this is because, uh, you know, 100,000 people are put all the, the list for donation a year. Uh, and in 20, I think the data shows, and I'm, I'm a big data person, the data shows, I believe, in 2021, 6,000 people died on the transplant list. Me. Uh, you know, 9 to 10 people are listed every mint. Um on the lip, all the lip, on the on the, they're meeting it. That's correct. So be at a hundred thousand people a year, a hundred thousand a year, thousand people a year. that are on the list. Correct. How many transplants do you guys do monthly, yearly? So um, it's kind of I can't really give those numbers out for a center, but I can tell you in twenty twenty two, the world of transplant. So you know, it's the United Organ Sharing. Uh, uh, United Network Mortgage Sharing uh, informed us that we did get 1 million transplants, and that's that's all organs included. Wow. But we get 1 million transplants in 2022, so that's a big deal. That is a wow. big deal. Um, okay, so do you know how many donors, how many organ donors are out there that are active? Uh, so I don't necessarily know the amount of organ donors that are out there. I can tell you that we know if, if you're watching this and you think, well, I'm, I'm older, nobody wants my organs, that's not the case. Uh, one in three donors are over the age of 50. I could tell you that. Um, and 85% of donors are waiting on a kidney. Yep. And the kidney is something that you can live, you know, with one. So if you call, if you feel compelled to, to donate a kidney, whether it be directly to somebody that you know that you know needs one or, or just anybody, uh, 85% of people on the list are, are needing a kidney transplant. And that's coming from somebody that has one kidney. So I, I do just have one kidney. So I am a model of, I can make it with one kidney, but I must that anybody can make it with one kidney. Right. Um, so yeah, just interesting data to put out there. Uh, and then I, I think that Drew is going to leave a link, uh, for how to become a water donor and sign up to be a certain donor. Uh, that's a little I don't We'll wait till tag your fuck. Um. So what's what's next for Finn? Is there is there anything that we're you know, cutting technology or ways of making it more? Because I mean, being an organ donor, you're right. I mean, you're gone. Right. So I mean, if there, it's to not do it is is almost comes across to be a little selfish or maybe a, a little like well almost flip it about it. Like they nobody needs it, you know, or yeah. they're not going to use it or I think a lot of it boils down to education, um, and, and awareness. I would never, uh, you know, I guess use anybody cause I'm not in that situation. I've never been asked to donate an organ. So I wouldn't call anybody selfish per se. Oh, um, I think folks down through a lot of stuff like this conversation, um, getting it out into the public and, and being able to explain and, and educate, um, you know, exactly what happens and why the need is there. Uh, I think, I think that's really helpful as far as increasing the amount of donors that we have. And then as far as what's next for transplant ban, there's, there's a lot of different things on the horizon as far as, you know, not necessarily with longer part, but I've been to conferences where they're talking about 3d printing organs, um, and injecting cellular material in on, um, all the way up to, you know, I worked with a surgeon one time that, 
Uh, size is a big deal when it comes to both hearts and lungs. And you can't really shave down a heart, but you can shave down lungs depending on the program that you're in and who you work for. And so people that are very small, um, and you have to understand kind of how we size lungs to, to follow me here, but you have what I refer to as shrinkers and growers. And uh, don't look at me funny when I say that, but what I mean by shrinkers and growers is you have certain people that have pulmonary disease that cause their lungs to grow in size, and you have certain people that have pulmonary disease that cause their lungs to shrink in size. Sure. The problem becomes if I'm already somebody that is very short, and I also have a problem that causes my lungs to shrink, it brings me down to a, a size of donor that is, is very small. Right. And ultimately, there's not small donors out there every day. Right. Uh, so it makes it difficult to size. And so, you know, with some of the, the newer things that are happening in transplant, surgeons will actually take donor lungs that are bigger and they can they can take out a, a right middle lobe completely. So now you just have, you know, your right lung, you typically have three lobes, your left, you have two. Well, now by completely Xing out that right middle lobe, now they only have two lobes all the, all the right, two lobes all the left, and they kind of drop that diaphragm down and make the lungs fit in there as to where some other programs, you know, don't do that or don't feel comfortable doing that. So there's always things like that on the horizon um, with, you know, advances in medicine and people trying to get as much out of uh, donors as we possibly can for our yet. Yeah, I was watching a podcast this week and um, the the guest was, is an astrophysicist, Neil Tyson. Yeah, man. And uh, he was talking about how we've elongated life in the last 10 years we our life expectancy has gone up five years yeah uh, and if you think about that that's pretty incredible yep yeah. and, and in the last 50 years we prolong life 20 years oh yeah and so you know i guess hypothesis was there's going to come a point where the possibility of living to 120 and 130 is out there sure. due to this type of technology that i do i mean it if you have a machine that can reform essentially, or you can make a 3D rendering of something, then that it's exchange and then take what you notice. Well, yeah, uh, after after your translate, right, right, to, to avoid rejection. And, and and honestly, we've had patients that you know for whatever reason they reject their first organ, and it's a, it's a very sad process called the acute rejection. Um, and so when acute rejection happens. We try to find them something else. And so we've transplanted the same person and, and gotten multiple sets of organs until, you know, they shake out. We've had to where survival rate, I'll, I'll speak specifically on lungs, as we say, 50% after five years. And all of this that I'm sharing is with general knowledge, and it's out there if, if you're looking for it for any kind of education. But any transplant center is going to have these numbers, but uh, 50% after five years. Wow. And so, uh, you know, it is kind of one of those things that it's, it's, it's about a hundred percent, right? But I can also tell you through speaking to some of the recipients we had and, and more specifically with one that actually came to a conference that I was at, that we were, our team was involved in setting his transplant up. He spoke and, and he said, has it been a long, hard road? Absolutely. But would I change it? And would I do it over again? I guess it was a question that he was being asked time and time again. And he said, I'd do it a million times over and think twice about it. Because there goes to a point, and I've spoke with people that are friends and family of many people that are saying, hey, I don't know, should I should I try to get listed? Should I pursue this? And my, my answer to them is there becomes a, there comes a point where your quality of life has to be taken into consideration. And if you're at a point where your quality of life is poor and you can't do anything because of your disease process that you have, maybe transplant is the answer for you because it does give you a second chance at life and it does give you that opportunity to be able to be a part of things that you've never been able to be a part for uh, or part of the, or wouldn't be a part of if you kept going on your certain, on your course. The coolest thing I've ever been a part of, well, I'll share two stories. One at EMS and one at transplant. One at EMS is something that you would think is is very 
that I was going to share this story that is just completely mind blowing. And honestly, it's not, it comes back to, to what I think both of these jobs come down to and that's customer service. And, um, there was one time where I took a patient all on hospice from the hospital. The family had talked to us about how, uh, he really enjoyed Lake Tyler and being able to go to Lake Tyler had a lot of special memories there with family. That was where he, where he was, you know, I'd be like to be on the golf course. This guy liked to fish all the way. Yeah. And so we cleared it with our dispatch and, and, uh, we were ultimately able to back our ambulance up to the boat ramp of Lake Tyler. Swing the doors open. The family followed us there. And I just remember the dude completely busting out in tears. And it was the most special thing I've ever seen because the family was able to come in there. They could take pictures. They could share that moment with them. Yeah. And it was, it was incredibly special. Uh, again, very basic story. But for me, it all boils down to yeah, cool. you create a moment. Create a moment. That they'll they'll that they'll they'll have for right. you didn't have to do it and and so the transplant side of things, I got a call from somebody that I thought was completely ganking my chain, and I got borderline frustrated because it was my my transplant phone. He was tied up the line, and he said, "Hey, is this so and so?" And I said, "No, this is a, a transplant phone. Uh, we need to clear this line." And he said, oh, that's funny. He said, what's, what is your name? I, I told him, my name's Dylan. And, uh, and he said, that's funny. He said, you know, I had a Dylan call me about four days ago when telling me that he had lungs for me for transplant. And he said, and I just wanted to call and thank you because the call that you gave me, and I'm in no way at all claiming that I'm the cause of any of those that have understood. I'm I'm one person in a team of very talented individuals and very special people that is was able to make all of this happen. Um but he, he called me and said, you know, your phone call saying I had a set of lungs changed my life forever. He said, because now I can be grandfather, I can be with my wife, I can see my daughter, you know, get married, I can do all of these things that I wasn't going to be able to do because I got the second chance and you were the one that bought me. So I wanted to call and tell you, thank you. I'm doing well. I'm edited to be at That's cool, man. And that was the most special thing that I've been a part of thus far in the transplant world. Very cool. I'm going to make one last pour, you know, a couple shout outs. This was our last pick, uh, the Garden Valley grew, uh, shout out to Jason, uh, to David and to Josh. Those are the other guys that were uh, part of the pick. Uh, it's made by Nashville, uh, Tennessee. It's it's awesome. MGT uh, whiskey. There was a sleeper. This this bottle was a big big sleeper bottle. Um, and I've I've got about three of them. I'm down to, well, I got a lot of them. I'm down to the lawn. So um, so I know in my uh, lot of work, there's a lot of compassion. I know in yours too. Um, there's been a couple of special people, mostly employees for me, but for you, probably donors or um, doctors in general. Was There has to be a time where you had a recipient that was like you got tired of looking at their name or you were like, they've been on the list for X amount of years or her and maybe you and your team or maybe just you, you made it personal that you were going to find a donor of some kind. You went above and beyond to get them what they need. So I'll answer that. Yes. And no, the reason I say yes and no is because yes, we will get heads up from our team that says, Hey, this person's not doing well. We need to find them something. We've got find them something. And that does light a fire under us, yes. But I will say no, because we do that for every recipient we get. Gotcha. Because ultimately, if I'm not working hard for them, they lose out on chances. And that's something that me and my team take very personal. We take a lot of pride in. And so we will work our absolute butt off to make sure everybody has every opportunity to be transplanted, and no matter who they are, uh, because we want everybody to have that second chance at life. That's full of it. Yeah. And that's, that's the best way that I can answer it. Are there those, um, ones that you, you see and you're like, man, we've got to find something before we've got to find something for this one. And, 
And the answer is yes. I mean, it's happened just this month. And we finally found something, and it's been awesome because we work, you know, and, and it's taken so long. But there's a lot of different factors in. Some people get transplanted after three days they're listed. Well, some people are listed for four years and they'll get a transplant. Right. And there's a lot of factors that come into that to play. Um, but we try to work our absolute well to make sure that they get every opportunity afforded to them to get it away. Cool. Uh, well, really appreciate you going. Man, it's man, fun. Man, that's been fun. Yeah, yeah, I know it. Man, we had some great pool. Yeah, man. It's an interesting topic. Um, it's not something you think about. Um, I'm, a, I'm a donor uh, myself, and Summer is too. She's you know, in the uh, medical field. So uh, it's just made it more important for me to get message out and, uh, and and make sure that you know folks know that easy to do. We'll put the link on there for you. Yeah. Uh, so that way people can, can do their own investigation and, and hopefully, uh, you know, get registered if they're not. Um, it was an awesome conversation. I really appreciate you coming on and having the boards and, uh, cheers. And, yeah, man, cheers. Um, so for the next, uh, for the next uh, episode, we have a local legend. Uh, if you want to call him that, um, he is deeply involved in, a local sporting store, I like outfitter. Uh, it's going to be a fun conversation. We're going to continue to make sure that we stay outside of just the whiskey realm. We want to talk to entrepreneurs. We want to talk to uh, people that are passionate. We want to focus on their spirit and you know, have a couple, couple of pours, you know, here and there. So uh, this is Spirit Squared. Uh, love to have you back next episode.